Welcome, Ashwin, back to Audit here. And he'll tell us about thin liquids. Well, we could read the title. And we will go to dinner. So if you see a large group, I assume, uh, we have to make a reservation. So if you want to go, to this, send me an email. We'll go by around six and send me an email by four so that I can to be available. Thank you. Uh, very pleasure to be uh, um, back here. So gonna, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be back here at Princeton, also at the IES. I was here. Uh, months back uh, it was a, a lot less lively than it is now <laughs> it's good to be back than uh, anyone else is okay. i'll um, uh, you know i realize this is sort of a, a very mixed audience uh, and i'm going to try to tell you about uh, some um, work that we are very excited about we, we call it spin liquid physics um, but for this audience i'd like to think about it more as how do you realize uh, the deconfined phase of a gauge theory uh, the gauge theory will be emergent. Uh, we'll just begin with a, a bunch of uh, spins of you know uh, quantum bits, and uh, the low energy physics will be indistinguishable from that of the deconfined uh, gauge theory. Yes, of course, this is a uh, this has been a long-standing kind of dream for uh, people in different areas, um, and I'll, I'll uh, try to tell you how this problem uh, has get some new life uh, from the fact that we have. Uh, very um, uh, sort of a revolution in the kind of quantum systems uh, that are coming online uh, that you can access. Uh, they also give you new capabilities. So I'll uh, talk a little bit about realizing spin liquids and these controllable quantum matter systems. Uh, but uh, more than just being an engineering or a, or a blueprint generating exercise, uh, I'll try to argue it gives you a lot of new conceptual problems to think about. Um, one of the things we're most excited about is how to use measurement uh, to create uh, non-trivial states of matter, of create um, uh, uh, states which have uh, a very unusual form of entanglement. Okay. Uh, so you know, measurement is not something we think about every day, although we all of us learn about it in quantum mechanics. So it's been nice to think of this in a, uh, from a research sort of point. Okay, so now I need to advance. Okay, that's what uh, <clears throat> okay, so let me give you a very quick overview of, uh, of the talk. I'll start with an introduction because many of our terminologies may be different. Uh, and there's kind of a bewildering uh, number of different ways of seeing the same, uh, the same thing. Um, I'll try to um, you know, I'll talk about a few of them, how we think about different phases of matter, spin liquids, how to think about this as deconfined gauge fields. and also how to think about it in terms of entanglement, okay, which may be the most uh, powerful way to think about it. Uh, then I'll tell you about how um, uh, we propose to create one of these uh, states in, in a synthetic uh, uh, platform. I'll also tell you a little bit about the experimental results, but I don't want to focus too much on that. And finally, I'll get to the new part about how we can use measurements to create even more non-trivial states, uh, states which are non-abelian uh, uh, topological order. Or non abelian uh, deconfined phase of non abelian gauge fields. Yeah, and these are the kind of platforms we're interested in. So they could be sort of like cold atom systems, so uh, atoms trapped to uh, lattice potentials. These are getting increasingly sophisticated. Uh, they can be made to interact very strongly, or they could also be things like these quantum processors, the, uh, like the, the IBM or the Google quantum processor, where you have some degree of control over the quantum bits. It's still nowhere near. What you would want for a quantum computer, but there are many qubits. They can do some things with them, and at least some of these protocols can be implement, implemented on them. Okay, so these are my theory collaborators. I also mentioned our experimental collaborators, but uh, all of this was done in very close collaboration with these three people. Nat is actually in the audience; um, uh, he's around this week, and Ruben will be here a little bit later um, uh, during this week. Okay, so so just in terms of the broad. Uh, picture, um, uh, what are we interested in doing? So we're really interested in finding new states of matter. And 
Uh, the simplest setting for this is gapped phases. So um, we don't have uh, low energy modes. Uh, we have some ground state, maybe a few ground states, but no other low energy modes. Um, and uh, the surprise is that even there, you can have distinct states of matter, uh, states that are uh, uh, entirely different from one another. Uh, so if this is kind of a schematic picture, there are these, uh, the sea of gapless states, let's say, and there are these different islands uh, of gapped states. Uh, and you cannot go from one to the other without crossing this gapless region. If you take two points within a gap phase, within one of these uh, uh, ellipses, uh, you can imagine changing your Hamiltonian adiabatically. Things change smoothly, you go from one state to another. So all of those states are equivalent, kind of defines an equivalence class for you. Uh, those are all the states that live within the same phase. You think of it as one point in terms of an equivalence class. Uh, then if you want to get to the other uh, island, you have to cross, you have to do something non-analytic, something that um, your, your ground state changes in a way that is not smooth. And uh, you can add to this picture symmetry. So uh, for a long time, people thought the distinction between states of matter is one of whether you preserve symmetry or not. And that's a sharp distinction. Uh, but what we have realized uh, over the last you know, several decades is that you can have subtle forms of difference between states of matter that they're always surrounded by this region of gaplessness. Um, and these distinctions can be very uh, hard to pinpoint, uh, but they're definitely there. Um, and uh, you know, one of the distinctions I'd like to emphasize here is the distinction between the long and short range uh, uh, entangled nature uh, of these states. Okay, so let, it's best to give an example. Uh, so here's sort of the simplest example where uh, in a single model, you can have two different states of matter. Uh, they share exactly the same symmetries, uh, but yet they are different in some, uh, in some deep way. Uh, so this is called the TOEIC code um, and written down in various different ways over, over the decades. Um, so if you look at it, it's simply a spin model. Okay, so you have spins, you have qubits of spins living at the vertices. Um, they can take on that two values, zero, one, up or down. Um, and you have these interactions between the Pauli operators. Um, I guess my cursor doesn't show up there, right? So there it is, yeah. Uh, you have these interactions between the Pauli operators, somewhat unusual looking interactions, maybe, a set of four um, spins interacting with one another, and then these other uh, single spin terms. Okay, but the important thing is this is not a model that has any constraints. It's simply a tensor product of these um, uh, spin uh, states uh, on this lattice. Yeah, but yet, if you look at the phase diagram as you vary these fields, hx and uh, hz, uh, you find that there are two phases. Okay, there is one phase here uh, at small fields, and then you go to larger fields, you get another phase. Uh, and you can show that all the region outside is you know, continuously connected. Uh, it's really one single phase out here, uh, but different, at least as far as we can tell from this um, phase diagram, different from the phase uh, uh, that's in, in pink over here. And of course, with the phases of matter, there's always this question, did you work hard enough? Maybe there is some other part that you didn't explore in this particular Hamiltonian that takes you from phase one to phase two. They are actually secretly connected. Uh, so ultimately, you have to come up with the positive signature, something that really you can tell is, is one or zero, one in this phase and zero in the other, okay, which cannot change uh, smoothly as you go between them. And we'll, we'll discuss such a signature over here. Okay, but to get, get some uh, bit more of um, a physical understanding why there is a distinction, it helps to think of these in terms of gauge theory. So we didn't put in any gauge description to begin with, but if you look at low energies, you can, uh, you can begin to see that there is a gauge theory hiding there. Okay? And um, um, uh, so in this particular model, for example, if you try to set this particular term, minimize it, set it equal to one, uh, you see the product has got to be plus one. So it's a, a, a bunch of four uh, sides where the product has to be plus one. You can convince yourself this gives you configurations that are simply closed loops. Okay, so there is a, a limit where uh, this, the, the ground state of this model, the low energy sector of this model uh, consists of closed loops. You can label those loops as electric field, if you like. Uh, and then it's saying that the divergence of this electric field is zero. So it's the Gauss law. Energetically, you're kind of imposing the Gauss law without any, uh, any matter field on, on the right side. Okay, so this is a slightly unusual form of electromagnetism because it has uh, just uh, two values for the electric field, zero and one. So it's a Z2 or, or Ising uh, gauge field. 
Uh, and in this limit, you can show that the ground state is simply a equal superposition uh, of all of these different loops, uh, uh, unbroken loops uh, together uh, in making up uh, the ground state. Yeah, so it's quantum superposition, it's a soup, uh, it's a loop soup. Yeah, by the way, sorry, you uh, yeah. flip the, the direction of the spin. I actually think of the links as having, oh, sorry, the spin lives on the, on the side. Okay. Yeah, so the spin lives on the sides. Uh, and then I drew this rotate, 45 degree rotated uh, lattice, which is this, um, uh, and now the, now the spins are living on your links. Uh, and you have two kinds of, uh, of squares. Um, uh, so the, the, the orange square over here uh, looks like a Gauss law. So it's telling you the divergence of the electric field emanating from that side is zero. And there's another one that flips uh, the electric fields around, creates um, a move for your electric field. So if you like, it inserts a loop of electric field or removes it. That's the magnetic sector, of course. So as you can see from this picture, you could have picked a different uh, 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 convention where everything is magnetic field based uh, rather than electric field. So there's a, a duality just like in uh, the electric magnetic duality of three plus one D, there's a two plus one D duality, where, uh, but where you go to Z2 rather than U1 gauge. Okay, so, so all of this is, um, uh, you know, way, a way to see that there is this hidden gauge theory, and this is the deconfined phase of this gauge theory. Uh, and as you crank up those fields, you get pushed into either the confined phase or the Higgs phase, depending on your convention, uh, and you lose this, uh, the deconfinement. Okay, you lose this. Uh, so many other things you can say about this. Um, there are excitations, for example, you make a defect uh, where this is not equal to plus one, but minus one. You're gonna pay some energy cost, but it's there in the theory. Uh, those are electric charges, if you like. Those actually have a one on the right side of the Gauss law. Um, there's another defect, which is uh, the analog for these variables, which are magnetic fluxes. They have mutual statistics, so you get anions in this theory against a particle with non-trivial statistics uh, and so on. So there are many different angles you can think about this, and uh, this, this kind of all come together um, in different ways. But uh, the, the angle I want to emphasize here is one of... Uh, Quantum entanglement, of course, this is very popular these days. A lot of the recent uh, uh, prizes have gone to this. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and in its simplest form, again, uh, very familiar to people here, uh, you have these two parties, A and B, and you can write down a uh, entangled state. This is um, the Bell state or the EPR state. Uh, and a way to detect it, of course, is to trace out one uh, part of your system, trace out region A, you get a density matrix for region B. Uh, and you can interrogate, interrogate that density matrix. It looks like uh, just the identity matrix, um, a uniform superposition of these uh, two configurations, zero and one. Um, so you, you evaluate its entropy, it's log two, uh, but we know secretly there is this correlation with the other state. Okay? Um, so this is all the entanglement of a few particles, extremely well understood. Um, and we'd like to uh, take this up to the level of many particle systems. Yeah, and just getting entanglement there is not a big deal. I mean, many ways to get entanglement between pairs of particles in a, in a quantum system. Uh, but we'll try to look for entanglement that is captured in a more subtle way, uh, which we're going to call long range uh, entanglement, which is what this, uh, the, the distinction between these two phases will actually reflect that long range uh, entanglement. Okay, so uh, in addition to just this um, <clears throat> definition of entanglement, you can think of entanglement as a resource, right? And uh, one of the most um, uh, you know, interesting things that you can do, uh, well, uh, there's a long list, but uh, here's one of the simplest ones that is uh, pretty interesting is this uh, idea of quantum uh, teleportation. You're asked to send a quantum state, relay a quantum state uh, from A to B. Alice is going to try to relay this to Bob. And it seems like a completely impossible task. Right? First of all, you cannot even find what your state is because of the no cloning theorem. You're going to make a copy and send it. Um, and besides, it's uh, you know there's a continuous complex variable that uh, quantifies your state, uh, the ratio of these two numbers. Uh, there's infinite amount of information there in some sense. You really want to accurately send your state over. So it seems like an impossible task. But if a priori, for example, the two uh, two parties shared and in, in a pair of entangled qubits, uh, then there's a very simple way to do it. Okay, and this is the quantum teleportation protocol. Uh, basically, your um, uh, Alice uh, takes the two pairs of qubits, makes a measurement, 
and then very importantly sends the result of the measurement just two qubits the result of that measurement to uh, to bob so it's this entanglement plus classical communication uh, and then bob will find by doing some simple operation on this side he can uh, fix his qubit to be an exact copy of what it was uh, of what was there to begin with you know of course not truly a copy because you killed the original one um, but uh, you've ended up teleporting your qubit. Okay, so I, I was just to remind you of this, um, uh, how entanglement shows up, but also because we'll see that in our measurement-based protocols, uh, something very similar is, uh, is actually uh, So just uh, just remind you. Okay, so this is entanglement and fun things you can do with it in the level of two qubits or three qubits. Uh, what if you have an extensively large system like the one I had before, an infinite number of qubits, um, uh, with local interactions, you end up getting these different states of matter. Uh, can you distinguish them using entanglement? And um, uh, so, the, of course, the, the analogous procedure trace out the region B, uh, and you're left with the, the density matrix on region A. Um, and uh, uh, you might have hoped that that itself, just looking at the entropy there, would help you tell the difference between the different phases we're talking about. Um, now, it turns out for gap phases of the kind that we're interested in, um, most people believe that uh, the way this entanglement scales or the size of your region uh, is just by, uh, according to the boundary, the length of the boundary perimeter law. Um, so that in itself does not distinguish these different gap phases. Maybe it tells you you're in a gap phase uh, or in a, you're in a phase with relatively low uh, entanglement. Um, so in some sense, the distinction we'll talk about is not a quantitative one. It's not like one has more entanglement than the other. It's really the quality of the entanglement is going to be different. Okay, so, uh, so the really interesting piece here is the subdominant piece. Uh, so there is a constant term, a subdominant constant term, uh, which is the one that is associated with the distinction. It's called topological entanglement entropy. And for the Z2 gauge theory, it's really going to be uh, a fixed number, this uh, log of two. Yeah, and one way to think about this uh, log two uh, is that because of the Gauss law, uh, the fields are not as random as you think. You actually have a little more information about the electric fields than you might guess because you know they satisfy this constraint. And you have exactly one bit of information. You know there's no electric charge inside. And that winds up being a reduction of the entropy. So entropy is your ignorance. Um, reduction of the entropy by exactly log two. Okay, so, um, uh, so this is really the distinction that you get. Um, uh, and actually, let me, let me give you a very simple argument why having this constant is actually non-trivial. Okay, so <clears throat> on the face of it, it seems like you have this large entropy scaling with the length. There's a little number that um, you, know, you get really excited about. Um, <clears throat> but why is it that a regular phase of matter, something that is not the deconfined phase of the Z2 gauge theory, why can't that produce a, a constant after all, it's just a small amount of entropy? Okay, but uh, the, the, the problem has to do with how it's scaling with the length of your boundary. Okay, so imagine you have some boundary and you wanted to attribute all the entanglement that you're seeing uh, to a sum of local contributions. Okay, that would be local entanglement, you know, short range entanglement. Okay, so then you, what you can do is you can have an expansion for the entanglement entropy of each region of your boundary. And it's going to differ, depend on local properties. So what your boundary looks like at that point. So it's some constant, let's say. Say you have a homogeneous medium, the same constant everywhere. And then you could have other things like, for example, the curvature at your boundary, uh, and then maybe derivatives or squares of the curvature and so on. So you could have some kind of a bit like a Landau expansion in, uh, in the curvature. Um, and then if you were to integrate this, you would get the uh, total uh, entanglement entropy. If you integrate the first term, you'll get the area law. That's the, um, the linear part. And actually, the second term has the right dimensions. The curvature is one over left, has the right dimensions to give you a constant. Okay, so if, if, if it was there, there would be no meaning to topological entanglement entry. But actually, it's not allowed. Yeah, and the reason it's not allowed, um, there's actually a symmetry in your entanglement um, entropy that you can exchange the inside and outside and you get the same uh, entanglement entropy. Okay, so you traced out A versus B, it was uh, you know, pure choice, which one you picked, a random choice, and you get the same answer. So everything should be symmetric under exchanging inside and outside. But curvature changes sign when you go from inside to outside. So if that term and everything like it, which is odd in this inside to outside uh, flip is disallowed. So the first non-trivial term is actually kappa squared, the square of the curvature, and doesn't, does not give you a, a constant term. It gives you something that's one of the, one of the left. 
Okay, so getting a constant term is non-trivial, and you can see it from this uh, this kind of plug. Okay, so um, uh, so this uh, idea of, of uh, you know uh, the kind of model I showed you is not new. It actually goes back almost fifty years uh, to Phil Anderson. He had a more complicated model in mind, and he kind of guessed the ground state. He kind of you know hand waved uh, his way to the ground state. Um, and uh, so his picture was uh, as follows: You think of some material, for example, uh, something with say copper ions that have carry spin a half on the sides of this lattice. Uh, and the pairs of spinner halves like to form singlets. So they form some singlets. They form uh, these blue bonds, which we'll call valence bonds. So there's this first step where you end up getting valence bonds. Um, so this looks like a chemical bond and it can fluctuate. It can have quantum fluctuations. Um, and um, uh, his picture was that, of course, they could just stay frozen uh, or they could fluctuate around. They could have quantum mechanical um, fluctuations like that, and you can end up getting a, a superposition of all of these configurations. Okay, so very much like the Z2 gauge theory model we had before, but here in, in a, a not such a fine tuned kind of limit. Okay, and again, by looking at uh, a reference state and the state that you have, you can superpose them and convince yourself that every state is represented by closed loops. So again, this has got this Gauss law uh, kind of feature to it. Uh, and if you did get the equal superposition, uh, you would uh, have reproduced this deconfined phase uh, that we talked about. Okay, so this was this idea for a quantum spin liquid. <laughs> it wasn't phrased in the language of Z2 gauge theory then. Uh, but now we recognize that if his idea was right, what he was proposing was that some material might just have, sitting in its ground state, a deconfined phase of a Z2 gauge theory. Okay, so none of the structures put in to begin with, it just comes about at low energies. And they're promising candidates uh, of this. So this is a very nice um, material that has the structure. Uh, it shows some signs of this kind of spin liquid behavior. It does not order in any obvious way. Uh, but people have still not found like a positive signature. For example, they cannot go and measure the topological entanglement entry or try to find some other positive signature. It's been hard. Uh, so for almost 50 years, we have not had like a real smoking gun um, you know, realization of such a quantum spin liquid, although there are many um, uh, you know, interesting candidates. Okay, so why would you be interested besides some intrinsic interest in um, creating new states of matter? Uh, well, there are a couple of very interesting ideas that go with this. Um, so one of them is that you get excitations that have new kinds of statistics. Okay, for example, you can get um, uh, chargey excitations that are bosons. Um, so I mentioned how these electric charge and uh, the magnetic flux uh, carry mutual statistics. Um, we should put it up. So, would people be able to see me if I wrote? Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to keep using this. So there's an E, which is the electric. Okay, so there's a bound state of these two uh, anion excitations. Uh, although each of these are uh, bosons, it turns out the bound state is actually for the ionic. So. And you can take this um, uh, excitation and combine it with an electron, the actual electron in your system, uh, and end up getting a charge, a charged boson, which could condense and end up giving you a superconductor. Okay, so that was Phil's, uh, Phil Anderson's idea, never quite realized, um, but again, one of the big motivations for this, um, for this field. Okay, the other one is uh, where the story code model came from, um, which is and protect uh, quantum information, um, which is again uh, another, let's say, complementary uh, motivation. Okay, so um, which of these? Um, um, uh, there are a bunch of different um, materials I mentioned. Um, for example, this uh, Robert Smithite, uh, which was one of these uh, spin liquid candidates, didn't quite, doesn't quite have a positive signature. Um, that is the um, uh, fractional quantum Hall effect that has similar physics. Um, but, uh, you know, again, that's in a somewhat different setting. 
strong magnetic fields, low temperatures, um, and you know, hard to access. Uh, the question is, can we do better than that? And uh, that's what this um, second and third parts uh, will be about. Um, can we have a way to prepare uh, these states uh, on a synthetic system uh, uh, that is actually uh, can be controlled better than we can control uh, regular materials? Um, and in the final part, can we actually use measurements uh, to do these things in a more efficient way? That material you mentioned, you mentioned on the right, it's uh, so this is supposed to happen on two-dimensional planes. So the yeah, that's right. Um, so that's a very two-dimensional material. It has couplings between in the third dimension, okay. uh, but very weak. Um, and one of the interesting things about these, um, you know, Z two or any of these deconfined phases is um, once you create them uh, in every plane, uh, weak interactions in the third third direction do not uh, destroy them. Uh, in fact, you know, unlike regular, uh, let's say you had electrons that are confined in two dimensions, you know, for weak interactions between the planes, the electrons can get across. Okay, they end up uh, moving in all three dimensions. Uh, that turns out not to be true for uh, these anions. Okay, so if you had uh, layers with electric charges in each layer, you put weak interactions between them, uh, the electric charges remain in every layer. Um, so they are uh, stable up to you know some finite strength of the coupling between layers, uh, and that's kind of the origin of these fractons and things like that. Um, uh, these these excitations have a larger kind of um, have a larger barrier to get across uh, from one layer to the other. Okay, so any questions? This is kind of the end of the review, and uh, it's kind of be switching to. Um, you know, uh, more of the recent stuff. Um, okay, so um, uh, so our, our, our approach to try to realize these uh, systems um, went as follows. We have this valence bond picture uh, that's almost 50 years old now. Um, so to simplify things, one thing you could do is to replace these valence bonds. Uh, by entities of their own. So let's say there is on the bonds of this lattice, on the midpoints of the bonds, you have some um, uh, uh, quantum bit uh, that uh, represents either the absence or presence of a valence bond. Okay, so uh, simplify that um, uh, picture before. Uh, the one thing you lose in this process is uh, before you had a constraint uh, that every side had one and only one valence bond coming out simply because it was spin a half. Uh, here, um, uh, in order to implement that constraint, you need to do a little bit more. Okay, you need some kind of energetics to uh, to ensure that if you have a, a excitation over here, uh, none of the neighboring sites uh, are also excited in a, in a, in a certain radius. And so you need some um, uh, you know some way to ensure that uh, these are the interactions that an excitation here will block uh, all the neighboring uh, sites from being excited. And um, it turns out that's uh, ideal if you have a, a, a qubit that enforces this kind of blockade. Okay, is there a way to, uh, what is the ideal system that will do this? Uh, and it turns out there was uh, such a system we knew of, which is these, uh, which are these Rydberg atom arrays. So you can think of it simply as uh, two states. On every side, you have two states. You have atoms, neutral atoms, which have two states. They're either the ground or the excited state. Um, but uh, what is special is that this excited state is extremely large. Okay, so you excite to the 70th level of your, uh, of your atom, uh, at which point they become the size of a small micro. You know, it's, uh, it's really approaching like micron sizes. Uh, and then you can have a lattice of them and then they will interact very strongly. Okay, so these are the, the, the kind of, this is the sort of uh, ingredient that can allow you to make this sort of blockade constraint. Uh, so I won't go into too many details, but uh, once you have this, you have the, the necessary ingredients. The natural interactions, if you select them right, uh, will make sure that if you have one atom which is excited, all the neighboring ones are not, so you automatically get the Gauss law. Uh, and then you have some quantum dynamics. You can drive the system between the ground and excited state. You use light to just do this driving, um, and that ends up giving you the quantum dynamics that are with us. Uh, fluctuations of these uh, of these electric fields, effective electric fields. Okay, so ultimately, this is the model. It's a very simple model. If you 
were to ignore these factors of P, uh, it's just some uh, model that flips the qubits, uh, sigma x, that's the back and forth. And then there is something that uh, tells you how, how many of these uh, qubits to excite. Um, and uh, all the interesting physics is really in this P, the projection, and make sure this flip-flop does not happen unless you can ensure there are no nearby states that are also excited. Okay, so uh, this is the model that we began with. And um, you, know, you can ask, does it have a spin liquid ground state? Does it have this kind of topological order uh, ground state? And for this, you know, once you have a specific model, you really have to do numerics. Um, and in the numerics, you, have, you basically vary this ratio. You vary the, uh, this delta just keeps, uh, gives you more dimers, gives you more of these uh, dimer kind of um, uh, things. And uh, delta becoming smaller is introducing electric charges, if you like, into your system. And if delta is too small, uh, you end up getting a, a condensate of these charges, uh, Higgs phase. That's a trivial phase, essentially. If um, delta is very big, uh, we found that uh, there's not, there, these things cannot move around much. They end up getting frozen. So you do get configurations that obey this kind of Gauss law, uh, but they do not resonate. Uh, so that's this valence bond solid. Uh, but in between, there is a non-trivial phase, um, which you know, to all practical purposes, to the naked eye, if you like, it looks just like this trivial phase. Yeah, so if you just look at the density of at excited atoms, uh, it look the same in both of these phases, but um, you see that the correlation length diverges. There's a phase transition apparently for no, uh, you know, for no apparent reason. Um, but then you can go and use some of the other um, uh, diagnostics we had. For example, you can go and check the topological entanglement entropy. Yes, okay, so you can divide the system, calculate the entanglement entropy, see how it scales with the length of that, that parameter. Okay, and what you find is that there is a intercept and this intercept actually depends on whether you are um, in, the, in the trivial or, the, or this non-trivial phase. Okay, and in the trivial phase, it's pretty close to zero, what you'd expect that there's no constant term. Uh, but once you get into this uh, non-trivial phase, this uh, spin liquid phase, you find something very close to the log two value that we talked about. Because so that's the first sign that there is something non-trivial going on. You're going from this short to long range entangled uh, phase. And you can see now why it's hard you know, if you are an experimentalist and you're trying to distinguish these two phases, you just look at things that are obvious that you can measure in your experiment, it's very hard to tell the difference. Okay, so how do you tell these uh, states apart? Uh, so really what we want to do is to uh, think about two um, points. One is in this topologically ordered or deconfined phase, one is just outside along some generic line. Okay, and we want to tell these two states apart. And we want to do it in a way that is kind of friendly to the experimentalist. Okay. Uh, so, so there are many, conceptually, there are, it's clear that they are distinct. Uh, there are many like uh, clear-cut distinctions that you can come up with. Um, and, but all of them seem to be hard to measure. Right? Uh, uh, actually, uh, when I, this, these slides were made about a year back. So topological entanglement, how do you measure it? Uh, it turns out since then, somebody has actually gone and measured it, at least in small systems on this Google uh, architecture. So, you know, these things will change with time exactly how hard it is to do these things. Okay, but uh, there's, a, there's an easier way which we found to do this, um, which is kind of has the philosophy of this Wilson line, uh, Wilson loop, sorry, um, uh, calculating the Wilson loop. Uh, so if you had a pure gauge theory without any matter fields, um, you could distinguish the confined and deconfined phases by looking at the Wilson loop, looking at its scaling, whether it's parameter or area law. Okay, and, uh, that would work if you were taking the system up along this line over here, uh, where there is, uh, you know, essentially in, in effect, because you do not have the second fluctuation, uh, you can think of this as a pure gauge there. Okay, there are no electric charges running around. Um, it's, it's sort of like a situation where divergence of electric field is always zero, uh, pure, uh, no matter fields, and then you can use the Wilson loop to distinguish it. Uh, but in our, in reality, where we are, uh, we don't have that luxury. We are somewhere here, uh, and in general, you are fluctuating matter fields. Um, and if you look at the Wilson loop, it's always parameter law. So it doesn't, it's not a useful diagnostic by itself. Uh, so you have to come up with something else. And uh, fortunately, there, is, there has been work on this in the, in the past. Uh, and there is a, uh, an idea to, uh, from with, uh, uh, starting with Friedenhagen and Marku, uh, for an order parameter that is generic, that's not restricted to the uh, pure gauge theories. And um, 
So it takes the following uh, form. Um, so if you had a closed loop, um, you know, this is something that is perimeter law. The larger you make it, the smaller it gets. Uh, but you can compare it against an open loop. Okay, so imagine an open loop of the same size as a closed loop. Okay, now, um, uh, is there a reason for one of them to be significantly smaller than the other? For example, the open loop to be smaller, well, you're inserting these anions at the end. So these loops actually create excitations at the ends, um, which are these anions. So in this particular case, you get the M uh, anion if you use this, um, uh, this string operator, which is simply diagonal in this basis, in this obvious basis. Okay, so you go, if you take away function, you take a minus sign every time you intersect uh, one of these uh, electric field lines, uh, that's your loop operator. And if it's open uh, versus close, that ratio, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, is something that you can look at. And uh, if this thing is, is going to zero, it's, if it's decaying exponentially uh, with increasing loop size, uh, that tells you that you're in this uh, deconfined phase. Okay, so it's kind of, um, when it's zero, it means you're in the deconfined phase. Okay, so that is uh, half of the, um, Diagnostic, you can make another one, which is for the dual uh, kind of loop, which inserts the E particles at the ends. Um, uh, and the two taken together uh, can help you identify this uh, deconfined phase, this spin, spin liquid phase. And we can check in numerics how this works. Of course, we are restricted to small system sizes. But um, so the speed loop that I talked about, the one that's diagonal in this gamma basis, you can see it's, it's pretty small over here. Uh, it's kind of persists into this other region, which is actually trivial and then, then grows. Uh, the other blue one uh, is the, uh, the other way around. And the region of intersection where they're both very small actually coincides pretty well with this um, spin liquid phase. Okay, so um, uh, you can think of this blue, you can understand this blue. This is the thing which has got the E particles at the ends. That's uh, the fact that it's non zero here is really uh, um, telling you that you're in this Higgs kind of phase, although it's. Uh, that's not a sharp, sometimes that can be not, non, not, not a sharp um, characterization. Um, but uh, the fact that it's zero, that is really important. That tells you that you're in this deep band phase. Okay, so um, I should mention this was, there was also work by, interesting work by Stan and David Hughes, um, um, which talked about this in a very different context, the context of sponge phases, same different and to distinguish different uh, soft matter uh, phases that um, uh, you, you cannot distinguish with regular order parameters. Okay, so, so there is a case to be made in this model. Yeah. yeah that if you get it for the electric, you could also get it for the magnetic. Uh, it's not obvious. Yeah, um, I don't know a consistent way to get it. I mean, so one thing could happen, for example, that is uh, pertaining to symmetry. Um, you know, if you didn't have the right quantum numbers for the, uh, you know, the right symmetric quantum numbers attached to the string, uh, it can be small. Um, but um, if you ignore things like that, uh, I don't know a model where generically you will get one to be zero, but not the other. From the answer, we know that this won't happen. Yeah. But from a, the way you've set it up. It's, yeah, it's not obvious. And especially if you think of thermal states, for example, not really ground states, thermal states, I think you could uh, set up a scenario like that, where one is not exponentially very small and the other is not. Yeah, but that's a good uh, question. I've not seen much discussion of this Fidnag and Marku, although it seems to be kind of fundamental. You know, if you really want to tell, you can find and can find uh, phases of a gauge theory apart, a discrete gauge theory, where you cannot appeal to something gapless at low energies. Uh, this seems to be um, a nice way to do it, but um, uh, yeah, I, I, I'd be interested, you know, later on, maybe if people have comments about how rigorous this is or not, um, it would be good to know. Okay, so, um, okay, so all of this um, is a kind of preparation for, you know, having enough um, Ammunition to go to an experimentalist and ask them to measure these things, right? So we have a set setup. Uh, we have a way to tell if you're in the spin liquid or, or not. And um, uh, something I didn't tell you is how you can measure the X loops as well. Um, but uh, uh, the way you would measure the diagonal groups is very simple if you had the experiment. So imagine somebody gave you a snapshot of all of these atoms. That's how these experiments work. You, you prepare a state and then you take a snapshot and you 
report back which are the excited states and which are the ground states of the atoms. Okay, so you get a lattice, looks something like this, about 200 atoms. Uh, the orange is where the atom is excited, and the green uh, is where the atoms are, but they are in the ground state. Okay, so the, the atoms are on the bonds of this uh, lattice. Uh, and you can kind of see visually this, you know, this is actually an experimental output. Um, you, you, you get a, a constraint being satisfied, right? If there's a dimer, there's no neighbor where there's also a dimer. Um, and if you are given data like this, it's clear you can evaluate this string order parameter, um, at least the diagonal one, simply by measuring how many of these bonds you intersect uh, when you go around group. Okay, so, uh, so that can be done. There's also a way to figure out how to do the other loop as well, the off diagonal loop. And turns out that is very important to say that you're not just some incoherent superposition of these incoherent uh, mixture of these um, uh, of these diamond configurations. So in experiment, you're getting just this data. You don't know, is it a current wave function which has all of these different patterns superposed? Or are you just you know, getting some decoherent mixture of that? By looking at these um, uh, loops, you just know that you're in the right you know, configuration space. You don't get any information about the quantum superposition, uh, but the off-angle loops will do that. And, and there's a way to do that as well. And um, uh, so this experiment was done in uh, uh, the group of uh, Diner and Lucan uh, mm -hmm. at Harvard. Uh, and essentially what uh, is done there, so uh, you know, usually you think of someone preparing a state as just cooling it. Uh, you take a solid and just cool it to low temperatures. Uh, so that's not what is done over here. Uh, instead, you start in some trivial state, for example, all of the spins being up, let's say. You change parameters and you, you drag the system into this, the state of interest. Yeah, and at least um, uh, as a first uh, approximation, you hope you're doing this adiabatically so that you, you kind of follow the ground state. And of course, in an infinite system, it's impossible to do this adiabatically because the gap closes at the transition. Uh, but in a finite system, which is in a very finite system over here, it's just uh, about 200 atoms, uh, you can hope that your rate is slow enough that you kind of scoot under the gap uh, and you adiabatically transform this system. Yeah. I can't read from here, but is this a real material or is this a simulation? Mm -hmm. uh, so when you say material, um, it's, it's, uh, it is kind of a material. It is a bunch of atoms sitting on uh, sites of a lattice that you can program. Uh, and uh, so it's an experiment, it's not a simulation, yeah. You might understand that the individual atoms are either in some ground state or in n equals to 70 ground yes. state. Yeah, that's right. What happens? How shall I put it? I, I kind of expect some diffusion of this Rydberg excited state. You know, there are a whole bunch of states accessible in between the ground and. Oh, no, no. You put it in a cavity where you excite it optically. Uh, so really, yes, one, one of them is, is optical and the other, the other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so the, uh, the only game in town for these atoms is between the ground state and that excited state in the lifetime awesome. of the experiment, which okay. is like milliseconds. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really a two level system. Uh, it's complicated, right? Uh, actually, the way you go from zero to 70 is not a single photon, it's two photon extensions. And uh, so I've kind of buried all those details. Uh, and you should probably ask the experimentalist to give you that thought. Um, but essentially, because it's in a strong optical field, uh, you go between the, and that sets the resonant frequency. You get only the, uh, the two levels, zero and 70, to a very good approximation. And you can check that because you make snapshots. Yeah, 70, so that the physical size of this excited state is roughly the wavelength of the light that's being driven. Uh, it, it has to be big. It, I don't think it's really the connection of the wavelength as much as the, the interaction between a pair of these external atoms should be comparable to the driving, the strength of the drive. Um, so you can, uh, but it's only when you get to these big atoms, they begin to interact. If you really have like n equal to one or two, you take these atoms, place them micron size apart, they don't talk to each other. Uh, neutral atoms don't talk to each other. So it's really when you get these highly excited states that they get strong interactions. So the big deal, at least to me, in terms of this platform, problem with cold atoms always has been they don't interact very strongly. At least they don't interact very well away from their own location. This solves that problem. Of course, it brings other problems also, but that particular problem, it solves very strong interactions between atoms. And once you get those strong interactions for things like this, you know, to have a constraint, for example, I don't want two of these 
cameras or buttons we could do another three minutes. Uh, this is like a 2D version of the earlier work they did with the 1D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, the effect of Hamiltonian also had projected. Yeah, right? yeah, PXP. Right, right. yeah. Oh. But the important thing is to know which 2D lattice to put it on. You put it on a different lattice, you don't get the S to this. And as far as we can tell, this is the only lattice that gives you the, uh, you know, everything seems to work well uh, to get this to liquid things. Does the system also exhibit these uh, revivals or stars? Uh, I don't think it's been looked at. I wouldn't be surprised. It's very constrained and all that. So I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of interesting things in the dynamics, which uh, uh, I think is unexplored. Uh, OK, so let me just compare the, um, just to show you that this uh, some of the things we've been talking about is relevant to the experiment. Um, so here I uh, compare two different things. The top one is the experiment, and the bottom one is uh, numerics. Um, and the numerics is not done in the ground state of the model. So you know it's a bit of an approximation to say you actually get the ground state. Best thing to do is to actually mimic the dynamics. Um, that's what's done in the numerics. And uh, so here is essentially trying to evaluate this Friedenhagen Marku order parameter. Uh, but rather than actually evaluate it as a ratio, you just compare open and closed strings. And uh, the point of that um, order parameter is that open string for the same length is much smaller than closed string. And you can see that um, in the numerics, are very clear. Green is the open, red is the closed. It's when you enter the spin liquid region that you, you get this uh, separation. And the same thing is seen in the experiment. Of course, the data is really great for the diagonal correlators, the off-diagonal. Uh, it's not that great, but it has the same kind of uh, um, flavor to it. Yeah, and uh, it's much smaller, the, the uh, axes are much smaller. So it looks like, at least in that small puddle, that small region that they're looking at, the state that is being formed is a fair approximation to this, um, uh, this kind of superposition of these timers, uh, as far as we can tell. There are many interesting questions, whether this is really the ground state, whether this is just a, a metastable state that is formed by dynamics. Um, and I think it really opens up this question of dynamics of these deconfined uh, gauge fields. Um, so there's another parallel work by the Google group that um, uh, where they literally used gates to create the, the Tory code state, just unitary gates. Uh, and then they actually measured the topological entanglement entropy uh, and got reasonable kind of value. Okay, but the one thing I want to point out in just the remaining 10 minutes that I have, uh, both of these preparations are slow. It's slow in the sense that the amount of time it takes uh, scales with the system size. So you double the system size L, the linear size of the system, you've got to double the time. Okay, so for example, for this adiabatic process to work, to stay under the gap, the gap scales is one over L. In a uh, CFT, for example, the gap scales is one over L. The time will increase linearly with the length. So we have that problem here, a slow preparation. Uh, this Google circuit also has the problem uh, because in order to go from a, 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 a product state uh, to one of these topologically ordered states, which have long range entanglement, you need a, a quantum circuit whose depth scales with the size of your system. And uh, these quantum circuits are really bad at, at depth. You know, they're very good at the gap that you mentioned. That, that was the gap in the, the transition between the quantum yeah. and scalpers. Yeah. So you want that. Yeah, yeah. And that's described actually, it turns out, by a 3D uh, ISING CFT. So in fact, it's a CFT and then scaling is really linear. Um, but in general, it's something that will you know, scale with system size, yeah. You constantly both in the introduction, now we talk about closing the gap. How, how, how do we exclude the first order transition? Yeah, so first order is the worst case. So if you have a first order transition, then this dynamics procedure does not work because you get stuck in the wrong ground states. So your best, your best bet is if it's a continuous transition. Uh, and then at least you have linear scaling. If it's first order, it becomes exponential. It turns out, if, at least numerically, this really looks continuous, this transition. Okay, so the question is, can you do it fast? Can you do it in a way, can you prepare one of these non-trivial states in a time or in a depth, circuit depth, that is, does not scale with the system size? So I can just go to bigger and bigger system sizes, but I have fixed circuit depth. Okay, so it's kind of a conceptual question. But also for a lot of these quantum uh, simulators, this depth is really the problem. You cannot apply gates for a long time without making errors. Okay, so um, 
so that's why I'll tell, tell you about, but you have to pay a price. And the price you pay is, is measurement. You've got to do measurements. And I can, I can, we can show how with unitary circuits and measurements, uh, not only you can get abelian topological orders, which is kind of known before, uh, the new thing we found is that you can also get non-abelian uh, topological orders of a certain kind. And the certain kind is kind of interesting. It, it gives you a division within the space of non-abelian topological orders into easy and hard. And uh, that division line uh, happens at some interesting place. Okay, so, um, uh, so this is, uh, I already mentioned, fast versus uh, uh, slow preparation. Uh, but this fast preparation also allows you to, you know, gives you a different equivalence class, a different equivalence relation between phases. Which two phases can be prepared uh, in the same amount of time uh, using this me using measurements? And that's another way to try to classify phases, which may be interesting. Okay, so the basic idea behind this measurement-based preparation of states, which goes back to uh, you know, uh, uh, at least a couple of decades, uh, is the following. It's a very trivial kind of idea. Um, so we said before we found the ground state of this pair of uh, stabilizers. Um, uh, yes, sorry, this, this pair of four span terms, uh, they're called stabilizers. Um, and um, uh, we did that by taking a system and cooling to the ground state. So you get the, the one where all of these stabilizers are plus one. Okay, well, you can do something else, which is you take some product state. Let's say you take this particular state easy to prepare. And then you simply go and measure these stabilizers. So you go and measure, for example, product of sigma z on the four sides. At the end of this, uh, you're an eigenstate of, of both of these stabilizers. Well, you're, uh, you, know, you have random signs, of course, for the, the out measurement outcome. Uh, you don't know whether it's plus or minus one, you get some random signs, um, but um, uh, you're guaranteed that uh, at the end of the day, you get some, um, you get some state, which is uh, the ground state of some Hamiltonian that looks a lot like this, uh, but perhaps with some signs up front. It depending on which uh, 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 measurement outcome was plus or minus one. Okay, so, uh, so this is a measurement-based way to, if you like what you're doing is, you're, you're starting in a Higgs phase, the trivial phase. You go and measure the location of the Higgs particles, and then you can, uh, you, you know, you can revive the dynamics of the gauge. Yeah. Earlier when you presented the Tory code, you also put terms by, with linear terms. Yeah. What right. happens if you add the linear terms here? There, yeah, they, they don't ruin the answer. Yeah, yeah. So, so here, here. Yeah, okay. so here, what you may ask, you may ask the question, what if I go around measuring these stabilizers, but occasionally I go and measure one of those uh, wrong uh, things. So that will poison the state. Uh, and it's an interesting question about stability. How much of that can you do? Uh, so it turns out for 2D, at least for infinite system size, even small amount of that will poison the state. In 3D, that's not true. Uh, so it's related to whether you have a finite temperature phase transition or not for that particular state. But that's that's an interesting stability question. So here I'll assume I'm ideal. Um, and I just go and measure these uh, these stabilizers. So when you when you measure, for example, that the new operator, are you keeping only the, the case where it gives you one answer? Or? Okay, so that's something you could do. That's called post-selection. Uh, in terms of efficiency, it's very bad, of course, because yeah. it'll be exponentially but small. That's not, what you're doing. that's not what we want to do. So what you want to do is you get some generic outcome. Now you could say, hey, this is not a toric code because some of those places have got anions. But actually those anions are static. Um, so you've got a wave function where you have static anions just put in at certain locations. So you could do one of two things. You could just keep a record of which places you have those anions. If you like, that's a ground state of the toric code with certain coefficients plus or minus one at certain positions here. And in terms of topological entanglement entropy or something like that, they're all equally good. Uh, or you could just do one extra layer where you go and correct those. Uh, and I'll show an example of that. Uh, it just requires single side gates. You just pick a set of sigma x or something to do on certain sides, informed by the measurement outcome. Um, and you can fix it and you can get the pristine to record. So that's where it has this flavor of this um, teleportation. Mm -hmm. You get some classical information about where, what the measurement outcomes are. You process that. You decide to do a gate, and then you get the, the, the original state. Okay, so, but we had a slightly different perspective. I'm almost out of time, so I'll, I'll have to speak through this a little bit. So we found a way to essentially do the, uh, to phrase this as a Kramer's Vanier kind of transformation, which in, that's the 
uh, that's one terminology, or if you like how to gauge a symmetric. So if you have a Z2 symmetry, you have the icing model on the left, how to go with the icing gauge theory on the right. Okay, so there's a way uh, using gates and measurements where you can implement this gauging map uh, efficiently. And um, uh, so the, the circuit looks like this. So um, you, you take the state that you want, you put it in on the blue legs, uh, the red legs have got uh, qubits already initialized in plus one, let's say, the sigma x eigenstate. You go through two layers of gates, and then you measure the blue legs. Okay, here, just for clarity, I've showed them to be post-selected to get a certain measurement outcome. In general, they're random, but we can fix it. So don't worry about that. Let's just think of getting a plus. And the claim is that the, the state you get on the red legs is actually the, the gauged version of the state that you inserted on the blue legs. So this is a way to just do gauging. Yeah, and I can describe later why this uh, works. So in 1D, for example, if you put in uh, an ordered, you know, if you put in the, um, uh, just the disordered state of the 1D icing model, you'll end up getting the ordered state on the other side. Yeah. It works with probability two to the minus n because you need it all plus. Uh, so there's no way to correct it if you get to There's a way to correct it, yeah, yeah. It's a way to correct it. So I can describe it for 1D uh, easily. So. Uh, it turns out these are locations of domain walls every time you get a minus one. And then you can go and flip spins uh, to correct the domain walls. Okay. And it needs only one extra layer. No, uh, one extra layer of certain correctly chosen spin flips. But you need to know the measurement outcomes. That's completely key in all of this. That if you did the measurements and you had no knowledge of the measurement outcomes, you can't really work with it. The sequence of gates similar to saying that you have these lines we could discuss, which are like a core duality lines, where you go from the line gauge to the gauge theory. Um, doesn't ring a bell, but maybe we should talk. Uh, okay, maybe I'm just. Yeah, but I have a simple way to see it. I can I kind of uh, skip that slide right now, but um, yeah. So so if you had a, a state like this with all of the x equal to plus one. You can show, you're going through this Kramer's Vanier map, um, that uh, the state, the final state is described by these other uh, products being plus one. So on these, um, the set of these five um, uh, operators product is plus one, and the set of these three operators is plus one. So that's what that uh, gauging map uh, does for you. And, and, and now we do the measurement, okay? It's part of the gauging map. Now we do the measurement on the blue sides, and uh, what you can show, what that gives for you is um, basically if the measurement outcomes was all plus one, uh, it would give you the product of these Z's being plus one. Uh, and uh, these things, this product being plus one is guaranteed because it's just a product of four of these. Okay, so, so this term uh, just comes for the right. You don't have to work hard for it. But this one, you, you do the measurement. Uh, and if all the measurement outcomes are plus one, then you're done. If not, if you get something like this, some of the measurement outcomes are minus, like here and here. Uh, this is the location of two of the defects, the E particles. Uh, you can find a, a string connecting them, uh, add the, the Pauli operator X, flip that string, uh, and then you can uh, clear up these anions. One extra step with the knowledge of measurement outcomes, uh, you can clear it up. Sorry, how do you know which way to run it? You don't, yeah, you uh, pick any, any direction to run it. Doesn't matter, yeah. So we're not trying to be efficient. Maybe there's some best matching kind of problem you can try to solve, but uh, you can just pick, you can actually pick a central site if you want and bring all anions there uh, and annihilate them there. You're guaranteed you're going to get even number of anions. So you're not going to end up uh, uh, in trouble. Um, uh, so at the end of this, you get the Toric code. Okay, so this is the thing that was known, uh, but now with this perspective that you have a Kramer's when you're gauging map, um, you can try to be more ambitious. Can you get non-abelian uh, states? Okay. And the most obvious way of doing this, if you just try to repeat this for a non-abelian kind of gauge group uh, sitting on the links and so on, uh, the most obvious way of doing this after the measurement gives you non-abelion sitting around. And these are actually a real problem. So unlike abelian and the ones that ended up in the ground state previously, ended up in your state previously, which you could get rid of in, uh, in uh, just one step, if you have non-abelian anions, they actually have degeneracy. Uh, they're not related to the ground state in any simple way. They are really different. Uh, they really kind of poison your ground state. 
And it's known that if you try to eliminate them with string operators, those string operators actually have a depth that scales with the length. So you're back to your original scaling. There's, there's no point doing non abelians like this. It only works for abelian extensions. In the previous case, you saw like exponentially many strings, but it, but it, it, it doesn't matter. You, you, you take any pair of them and draw any string between them. And that's why you, because it's abelian, that, that's why you can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can also choose not to do it and you can live with that state. And any, any question you want answered about that state, you can use the, the original one and the knowledge to, to answer. But yeah, if you want to clean it up, you do some classical processing exactly which lines I should do it. One a layer of quantum gates is enough to get it up. Yeah, but non abelian is just the most obvious extension does not work. Um, and yeah, but it turns out there is a different way to do it, which is you can sequentially gauge abelian groups. So you know how to do the abelian gauging, sometimes get a mess, you clean it up quickly, you can do another abelian gauging. So if you can build a non abelian group through sequential abelian gaugings, those are the ones you can access using this protocol. Okay, so um, example D4, um, uh, which can be obtained like this, uh, uh, extending Z2 by Z2 times Z2, you can, you can get using this protocol. Okay, so I'm actually out of time now. So Natty, what is the- um, How I, much time do you need? Um, maybe five minutes. Go for it. All right, if anyone wants to leave, yeah, feel free. Um, um, okay, so D4 is really the group of uh, the symmetries of its square, uh, rotations and reflections. Uh, it's a non-abelian group. Um, and um, uh, it turns out you can actually use this procedure uh, uh, to gauge it. Um, and um, uh, you know, end up with this uh, the D four topological order. Okay, so the the sequential gauging, um, uh, you know, the, what you do essentially is that you measure. When you do the measurement, you localize. Uh, so you take you first prepare two copies of the Torek fort. Okay, and when you prepare two copies, you then clean it up, like we said before, and then you gauge the swap symmetry, the thing that swaps the two layers. To gauge that as well, you end up getting this D4 topological order. At any instant, you only get a billion anyhow, so you know how to clean them up. Uh, so this was the initial thing we had. We had a two-step process where you measure, clean up, then measure again, and then, and then get the final state. Uh, but actually, this is a little hard for quantum devices right now to do this two-step procedure where they measure it. There's all kinds of things to their uh, system. So you can ask, is there a way to even do this non-abelian case with just one round of measurement? And for this particular group, it turns out you can. Okay, so there's a, yeah. Why don't you get like Z2 cube? Why do you get something non-abelian? Why don't you get yeah. like Z2 cube? Yeah, yeah. If you did it differently, you would get Z2 cube. Uh, the thing that you do over here is you gauge the swap. Huh? So there is, if you like, there is, uh, think of it as global symmetry initially. So you have two C2 topological orders and there's a global symmetry that exchanges them. Uh, you could also have had a global symmetry that doesn't act on them at all. If you had a global symmetry that did not act and you gauged it, you would get C2 cubed. Mm -hmm. if you have the one which swaps them, you get this D4. You're getting an outer automorphism of Z2 times Z2. Yeah, that's, that's right. A G8. Right. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so there's a different procedure. Um, Sorry, can I ask like more trivial yeah. questions? So, why, why not for the TARC code? I mean, there you also have a Z2 symmetry. So why, why didn't you just gauge that? That's what we did, actually, in the TORIC code. We just gauged the Z2 symmetry. But, but that sounds like D4, right? Yeah, but we want to get non-abelian. Well, um, you get non-abelian. I mean, if you, if you gauge the electric magnetic duality in TORIC code, you'll get something out of it. Uh, yeah, so the, we, we could do that as well. It's actually not that simple, uh, but you can do that as well. Um, so, so that is uh, like an ISEG. Uh, yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. So there's a way to get that too. Uh, but we found it easier to think of these groups that are quantum doubles. Um, so you have a group, you can use group theory. Uh, totally easier to describe uh, these, these, um, uh, these outcomes, so. Okay, and just to tell you that this is, it's not just a uh, uh, you know, pie in the sky, you can come up with a specific recipe, it's just six, uh, you know, six steps long uh, to create this D4 topological order, a single measurement step. Uh, possible to do on, on the on existing uh, technology. Okay, so um, 
Uh, so let me just, um, yeah, one more thing that I want to say. So what is this, the, the set of states that you can get, the uh, set of non-abelian topological orders within this quantum double world uh, that you can get using this procedure? Well, you need to have this ability to sequentially gauge abelian groups. And you can ask what are the set of groups that uh, that gives you, and that's really the set of solvable uh, groups. Okay, so uh, it gives you a specific uh, criterion when you can uh, create uh, the quantum double topological order, uh, which is essentially the group that appears in your quantum double is, is solvable. And uh, this word solvable has been around for a long time. Uh, as many of you know, it comes up in the theory of solving polynomial equations. So they can solve it with radicals like the quadratic formula. And in general, for the um, you know, fifth order polynomial, there is for the general fifth order polynomial, there is no such formula. Um, and uh, the reason that number five has to do with the fact that the first time you get a non solvable group is for the permutation of five elements. And uh, so, the, uh, this ability to create uh, a non abelian quantum couple, uh, the, the, the criterion that it imposes on the group, somehow is the same as uh, the solvability. Criterion for uh, uh, the group, the Pangor group of polynomials. Okay, so there are many other uh, minor things that I wanted to comment on. There's a Jordan Wigner analog of this uh, Kramers Vanier. Uh, Jordan Wigner, if you like, is a duality that takes bosons to fermions. Um, uh, you can write on similar circuit. Uh, a different way to view everything I said was to take a SPT, a symmetry protected topological phase, and measure it. And you can prove in general that gives you some long range entangled uh, phase. A different perspective, uh, you can get chiral phases as well. Um, also the kind of anion, uh, the icing anions that was mentioned before. And there are questions of stability, which Nati kind of referred to. Uh, I'm, I've run out of time, so I won't uh, uh, discuss any of these. So let me leave up my conclusions. Uh, the first part two of my talk, I think it raises some interesting questions about dynamics of gauge theories and the dynamics of confinement, whether they can be explored in a experimental system. Um, and you know, is, does this have anything to do with uh, questions that are of interest in particle physics and uh, you know, early universe and so on? Uh, now that we have some, you know, it's very primitive, but beginning to have an experimental uh, handle on this. And the second question was about uh, you know, getting new interesting kinds of states using measurements. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, one of the things you can create is S3, non abelian topological order, which is actually universal for quantum computing. So, you know, could we use this as um, the base on which you can construct some topologically protected uh, route to quantum, <coughs> uh, quantum information processing? And really, this measurement hierarchy that you get, does it have any physical kind of reflection? You know, if you just think about non abelian theories, are there some physical dividing lines at the same places where you get those measurement? Uh, okay, so let me stop over here. Maybe you already answered this here, but um, so these solvable non, uh, non abelian theories do they allow for general quantum computer? Yeah. Um, so this S3, for example, this S3 uh, is part of the class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are some distinctions there that I don't fully understand. Like, for example, with A5, which is non solvable, uh, you can just use the fluxes and do uh, universal quantum computing. Whereas for S3, which is solvable but not nilpotent, turns out there's another distinction there which I can refer to. Um, by using both flux and charge, you can do universal quantum computing, but not with only the fluxes. So somehow there's a reduction in power, it seems, between the non-solvable case, solvable but non-nilpotent, and the nilpotent case. And these roughly correspond to, we cannot make it at all. We can make it with multiple shots of measurement and feedback, and we can make it as a single shot. Um, so the D4 turns out is nilpotent, that's why I could make it in a single shot. Uh, yeah, so there is some interesting connection, I think, between power upon the computation of power and how easy it is to make, which maybe it makes sense. You know, it's kind of no free lunch kind of uh, a reflection of that. But uh, they seem to be surprisingly within reach. Like for example, some first one, this D4 seems to be, you can make it on the devices. What does measurement consist of in the case of your, you know, Redburn atom realization of so, I mean, yeah, basically all I can do is measure 
at which lattice sites is there a red bird and is there not, right? Yeah, yeah. So in the, in the red bird case, actually, what would really help is the technology where you have two species of atoms. Yeah. On the bonds and sites, you have different species of atoms, and then you can just measure one set of them. You figure out ones and zeros, whether they're ground or excited, and you throw them away. And what you're left with is the quantum state along that trajectory. You got these measurement outcomes, the quantum state uh, on the remaining Redberg atoms. That is like really ideal. That would be the ideal thing. And people are making these dual species. The single species, you end up measuring every. So you do post processing, but you know, it's really nice to have the quantum state on the other sides after you do the measurements on, on the measured sites. How do you imagine what 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 uh, what are you thinking about for uh, for extending to continuous gauge groups, to huge discrete groups, something else? Um, yeah. So, and the thing of this is some sort of uh, toy model for confinement. Um, now, of course, if you had a continuous gauge group, either you, you may not even have the deconfined phase to begin with, or uh, if you do, that has gapless excitations. There's another can of worms uh, coming in there, but at least as far as you know, one sector of the theory is concerned, which is coming down for some of that uh, transition, uh, maybe that physics can be seen uh, here. Yeah, we can also, there are also ideas for how to try to get to the continuous gauge groups. For example, if you have these diamond models on bipartite lattices, those correspond to a U1 uh, group essentially. Uh, I have no more questions, so I remind you send me an email by four. Or to dinner, we'll meet at six here. Let's thank you.